and it should be popping up for me. There we go. All right. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you again for attending today. Um, our Ask Our Alumni Environmental Sciences Careers During COVID um, virtual um, panel event. Um, so today um, we are really excited to be kind of going over, you know, what's going on in the industry um, with, of course, our amazing panelists. Um, but to get started, in case I don't know you or you don't know me, I am Julie Winter and I am the Student Career Advisor here at Northland. Um, my office is in the Dexter Library, actually in the basement. Um, and I'm right across from Megan McPeak, the Student Success Coordinator. So um, that rings a bell. And Jackie, I'm going to push it over to you. Thanks, Julie. Hi everyone, my name is Jackie Moore and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and Annual Giving. Uh, my physical campus office is located in 212 and uh, Brownell Hall, so it's just at the top of the stairs. I do have a dish of stickers and other cool things outside my office, so if I'm not there, you can still take a treat. And for our alum who are joining us, when you can visit campus again, and if you're looking for me, that's where you'll be able to find me. But mostly, thank you everybody for being here tonight. We have a stellar crew lined up and just looking forward to adding the next in a, this phenomenal series, highlighting the great work our alumni are doing in whatever corner of the world they're calling home these days. So welcome. I am sure you'll enjoy this evening. And Julie, thanks so much. I'm going to turn my camera off now too. All right. OK, so um, just to get started, we're going to go through our panelists and um, take some time for each of them to introduce themselves. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, who you are, your major and minor at Northland, you know, what you thought you were going to be when you grew up and any other, um, you know, helpful things about your path to um, that helped you get to where you are now. Um, so, Tim, I'm going to call on you first. OK. <laughs> Yes, uh, so I, I graduated from Northland in uh, 99. I uh, went to school there for environmental studies. Uh, my major was uh, with the emphasis on natural sciences. Uh, so I was kind of, my, my goal was to kind of get uh, into uh, more of like a biology conservation type of career. Um, growing up though, I, I started out, my career passion was a farmer when I was probably like five years old. and. Then it uh, went from uh, school bus driver to uh, weatherman, so I wanted to be a meteorologist. So that kind of was a, what inspired me about my book that I wrote there. Uh, don't buy it online because somebody I think bought a couple of copies and trying to sell it for a thousand bucks. If you want a copy, uh, reach out to me. I'll, I'll give you a copy, and I will. Uh, I'll also send you an additional copy to donate to the library or uh, your local neighborhood lending library so um, but uh, yeah yeah and then uh, then yeah uh, after that I, I really wanted to pursue something like in uh, like uh, field biology conservation it just really resonated within me um, uh, we we're kind of talking about how we got uh, you know inspired to go to Northland I, I received the uh, pamphlet uh, probably from filling out my uh, financial aid forms and it was this college that appeared uh, with a red canoe on it I'm sure many of the alumni really are familiar with it and I read it and I was like man this, this sounds really great but I don't know if I could afford it and uh, yeah and it, it actually did work out uh, financial aid was packaged was perfect so so it, uh, it so when I was at Northland uh, I really uh, a lot of my focus into uh, like a lot of the taxonomy classes like field ornithology, um, just uh, ichthyology, all those kinds of classes there, um, botany, uh, dendrology. So, but uh, I, I really love the uh, research aspect of it. And uh, today I, I still use those, uh, just that, that drive for research uh, in my current role right now being a mint technical manager because um, right now we're uh, we work on uh, sustainable solutions in the agricultural industry especially as it relates to mint and uh, with uh, mint uh, there's a problem uh, kind of like right now we have a pandemic with uh, COVID-19 well in the mint world in the 1950s there was a pandemic too uh, it was called Versilium dahlia 
it's a fungal infection that uh, ravaged uh, the mint fields. And so a lot of the farmers, they had to uh, try and flee the uh, Midwest and they ventured out into the Pacific Northwest to uh, try and flee the, this uh, fungal infection and it uh, followed them. And uh, so uh, the organization I work for, it's a, a 70 year uh, program that they've uh, worked on and uh, they use uh, just uh, the natural uh, plant uh, variation to um, uh, work with uh, the men to uh, develop um, genetic varieties that are uh, uh, just, uh, just they uh, are resistant to uh, this uh, fungal infection. So. Oh, interesting. Well, we'll hear more about it when we go through kind of typical days. Thank you so much, yes, Tim, for yes. kind of explaining. Um, all right, Christine, you are up. Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here today. I feel so far from northern Wisconsin. I live in Portland, Oregon, and I've been here actually, it's hard to believe, for 18 years. I, um, as you can see on the slide, I graduated Northland in 98. I was there between 94 and 98. And um, I ended up going right to graduate school uh, at the Evergreen State College in Washington because I didn't know what to do with myself because I still wanted to learn. Um, when I was at Northland and actually both when I was getting my master's, my focus was really on environmental law and policy, specifically as it relates to toxics and, and water for the most part, though I was sort of generally interested in lots of things. Um, I went and um, was a Peace Corps volunteer for two years. And when I came back to the United States, we were in a recession, um, which is probably not unlike anyone that's going to be graduating in 2021. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, did everything I could to um, find find a job and, you know, applied for tons and tons of jobs. And it turned out that um, someone I had done a internship with when I was at Northland, Mark Charles, who actually also was a Northland alum, um, he had moved out to Oregon and um, he was recruiting for a position that was limited duration. And um, at the time, I was not at all interested in doing public service work like at all. Um, but it's it's interesting where your path takes you. I, um, I needed a job really bad and he hired me and I was really grateful to get my foot in the door. And now, you know, it's been 18 years and I've had multiple different jobs since the first one. Um, that I started here and I at least for myself I can't imagine not doing public service work so I'm excited to talk to you all today I'm always glad to follow up with folks um, at any time because I think that um, the public service sector really needs people like North that went to Northland <laughs> and um, because you know the things we learn and the way that we're taught to think about the integration between things is really you know what the real world is um, but so many people in the uh, public sector don't learn those skills. So um, yes, if anyone is even remotely ever interested in public service work, doesn't have to be for a state agency, um, I would love to chat more about it because it's it's really rewarding on so many levels. It's frustrating, um, but most jobs are frustrating. So uh, look, like I said, I'm glad to be here and look forward to answering any questions. Awesome. Be careful. Now I'm going to be sending all of the students to you that <laughs> mention anything about that. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, OK, next is Bill. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Bill Hogseth. I'm glad to be with you. I graduated from, from Northland in 2007, as you can see, with a major in environmental studies and ecological restoration. Uh, I grew up in Wisconsin um, and I was lucky to have a dad who introduced me to the outdoors. He took me uh, camping in the Boundary Waters every year and uh, really instilled a love of nature in me at an early age. Um, but that wasn't something I ever really connected uh, to in terms of a career path or something that I could do uh, with. Um, and after I graduated from high school in Eau Claire, I, I spent about five, six, seven years, um, honestly, just kind of being lost and um, moving around the country, working random jobs, um, and had some really interesting experiences and learned a lot about the world and people, um, but really didn't know where my life was going. And 
I, uh, in 2003, I was working the night shift at a hotel, feeling like my life wasn't really going anywhere. And I, on a whim, decided to hike the Appalachian Trail, not really knowing what I was getting myself into um, and really haven't, hadn't been camping or backpacking in years. Uh, but I did it and I completed it. And I'm glad I did it because there was a day uh, in North Carolina after a long, long day and I was tired. And I kind of had an epiphany looking out over a river valley that I had found my purpose and my purpose was to work on behalf of, of nature uh, in the natural world. And that led me to Northland, which is where I enrolled uh, immediately after I got done with the Appalachian Trail. And two things um, happened at Northland that were really transformative for me. One is I learned, um, I learned and was exposed to ecology and what it means to study the natural world with a, a real keen attention to detail. Uh, I had a teacher named Jim Meeker, who was an um, amazing mentor to me, and I, um, uh, I owe a lot to him. The other thing that I learned at Northern was activism, and I had a long-term internship with a group that uh, was fighting logging sales on the Schwamigan Nicolay National Forest, uh, where there were endangered species um, in the proposed timber sale sites. And both those were really amazing experiences. After I left Northland, I wound up, um, I actually thought I was going to go into the activism side of things, but the way jobs unfolded for me, I ended up in the natural resources world, and I ended up working as a wildlife biologist with Wisconsin DNR for 10 years, uh, where I focused um, very much on birds and researching grassland birds and also uh, managed land. Um, I became a burn boss and worked on um, uh, guiding prescribed burn crews to burn over a thousand acres of grass a year. Uh, I also worked with hunters uh, to do deer management. Um, and two realizations came to me while I was working at the DNR. Uh, the first was that a lot of the conservation problems that I wanted to solve um, were went deeper than just collecting data and making good scientific decisions. Um, there is something in addition to wildlife and natural resources that we call human beings, and they have a huge effect on the way we manage natural resources. So I discovered that people and their attitudes and the decisions they make um, you have to learn how to how to manage that if you're going to manage conservation issues. And I learned that on issues like chronic wasting disease and the way private land use decisions affected the birds that I was studying. And then the other thing I learned at the DNR was I was uh, had the had the uh, I had the experience of being a, a biologist during the Walker administration, and I also learned that uh, conservation, when you're a government biologist, also um, gets complicated by issues of power uh, and who has it because I saw a lot of the things that we wanted to do in terms of good science were um, made more difficult by the Walker administration and that the reason I tell you those realizations is because that's what led me to my current job which is with the Wisconsin Farmers Union and I decided to leave a cushy government job with a good retirement package uh, so that I could work directly with the people who are closest to the problems people who manage the land uh, and those are farmers. Um, so right now my job focuses on working directly with people uh, to help bring them together and to help set goals and to build community uh, so that we can engage people in making good conservation decisions. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that uh, later on in the presentation. Thanks for listening. I love hearing these paths, they're amazing. And Bill, we would love for you to turn your camera on if you can. Um, okay, so then next is Jessica. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jessica Lohman. I graduated from Northland in 2015, um, which is hard to believe that will be six years ago soon. <laughs> um, I double majored in biology and natural resources with emphasis in wildlife and fisheries ecology. Um, if you look at the slide, you'll see that I was very busy um, during my time at Northland. I had a number of internships at the Field Museum, Field Museum in Chicago. I interned in their herpetology collections department, conservation science intern in their uh, Chicago Regional um, Conservation Department. I was a women in science undergraduate research intern where I focused on um, 
economic botany, which is a very interesting field, but I essentially helped um, identify plants from a anthropology site in Mexico. Um, I also was a part of Brown River Conservation Studies, where I spent a study, I uh, spent a semester in Namibia, Africa, bush camping there while helping with conservation research. Um, and then for stuff that I did actually on, on campus, I was the first year experience orientation coordinator. I'm not sure if that's a, a class that still exists, but I, I taught the orientation um, class. I also was the biology department lab technician with Andy Goyke um, for three of my four years at Northland College. And then I also was the aquatic invertebrate class teaching assistant for two of my years um, at Northland College. So. Um, I did a lot. <laughs> I kind of was uh, a little busy all the time there, but that's kind of how I like it. Um, after Northland, uh, I took a gap year because I knew um, at that time I had, you know, some personal life stuff that was happening and I knew I wasn't going to be ready to jump right into going to grad school. So I uh, took a position as a mammals research assistant at the Field Museum of Chicago, where I studied bats of Kenya for a year, a little bit over a year. And then I began my graduate degree at the University of Georgia, where I got a master's degree in forest and natural resources with the emphasis in wildlife ecology and management. Um, so I've had a very uh, research heavy background thus far, but that's, um, you know, it's kind of where I expected myself going kind of when I was young. Um, I do come from a first generation college family. So when I said when I was young, I wanted to be a scientist, I really had no idea what that meant at all. Uh, I kind of you know, just thought like test tubes and all that fun stuff. Uh, and I also wanted to be a race car driver, but that didn't work out either. <laughs> but, um, so where I'm at now is definitely, you know, I thought I was gonna be doing something with science. I didn't know what that meant because I didn't know what a scientist was at that time. Um, and it really wasn't until I got to Northland where I was able to really see, um, you know, where my passion for science could take me and what science could look like and how I can combine my love for science with my love for being outside. Um, my parents, you know, even though, you know, we didn't have a lot of money and stuff, they always encouraged my love for the outdoors. I grew up across this, the street from a state park and my dad put a bench outside for me where I would always eat my lunch outside when I was really young and I would write down all the birds and everything that I saw. Um, so I was able to, you know, kind of combine my love for science and my love for nature um, with my degrees that I've had thus far. Um, also, after my time at uh, University of Georgia, I had a contract position at the Zoological Society of Milwaukee, where I was a consulting conservation research specialist, where I was helping redesign their conservation department. Um, sadly, that contract position ended right as COVID was considered a pandemic, which did not work out well for me as far as looking for a job. So I actually only recently landed my new job. Um, I'll be here about three months in the next couple of days, but I'm at the National Great Rivers Research and Education Center, which is in the St. Louis area, but on the Illinois border. Um, they work in conjunction with Lewis and Clark Community College, Illinois Natural History Survey, and University of Illinois. So I actually am also a research affiliate with the University of Illinois. Um, my official title is an environmental technician, though we're going through kind of a redesign phase. What I do more is uh, more of an associate research scientist. We'll get more into my day-to-day -day, uh, tasks, but I focus mainly on amphibians and reptiles at this time. And I'm also a member of the board, alumni board for Northland, and I manage the alumni Twitter, so. She's very important. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you so much everybody for kind of the overviews. It really helps us to sort of know where you're coming from. Um, so uh, the first question that we like to start with is just to describe a typical day in your position, both you know before, if you had the job before COVID and after. Um, so we'll just go back through the same order that we had. Tim, if you'd be willing to just give us kind of the overview of what does a day look like for you? Yeah, yeah. Typically, my my day before COVID uh, was uh, just um, my my role is pretty much uh, all analytical uh, as far as like the analytical support. Uh, so a lot of the uh, research and development uh, team globally uh, for Mint relied on me. So I'd get uh, samples from like China, from Europe, uh, Middle East, uh, uh, just uh, all over, and uh, what we do is. Uh, We'd uh, work on uh, product development uh, as far as like uh, researching the profile because Mint is uh, quite unique in uh, in that uh, 
what you call mint in uh, maybe Japan and the US is completely different what you call it in uh, Europe and uh, maybe Asia like China. It, it, uh, there's a type of uh, mint it's called Arvensis and it uh, kind of has a little bit more of the more of the mentholic uh, type of cooling uh, peppermint uh, stick kind of profile where uh, the, the deeper, richer profile is uh, more in uh, North American uh, and uh, Japanese profile. So, so it's just uh, kind of interesting to see the, like the uh, variation from growing districts of how like the environmental factors uh, change the profile. And then it's just like wine when you have wine and grown in different areas of the world, like Argentina, California, France, you get these different chemistry profiles so uh so it's a kind of a unique thing about my job is I, I get to really do a lot of that research in there uh also the the programs that i was kind of mentioning is uh we, we have a major uh, sustainability initiative where we have a plant science program to deal with uh the COVID 19 of the mint world which is uh universal in dahlia as i was mentioning is a fungal disease uh, so those kind of things there. So it uh, allowed me to go travel to the growing districts in Pacific Northwest. So I'd be going to like Idaho and Washington just to kind of study some of the, the varieties there. We'd have experimental plots out there. So we'd study uh, uh, maybe uh, irrigation uh, testing and uh, just uh, the yield for the varieties, uh, just uh, making sure that those uh, still meet and uh, the analytical profile is very important uh, for my industry. Uh, uh, everything is volatile, so you're using volatile oils. They're all essential oils, like what you see with lavender and, and citrus oils. Uh, so uh, with that, you need to use the instruments like uh, GC technology and uh, GCMS. So it's kind of interesting, my story, uh, when I was getting interested in my career, uh, going to college, I, I, I didn't take as much chemistry because I wanted to be a, a biologist and I, I kind of avoided that. And uh, hopefully my colleagues don't hear that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, after I worked a couple of jobs, like uh, I, I got into uh, a drinking water laboratory and some of the other things, I, I, I really, uh, knew the, the the need for that so then uh, I, I landed it in a position where uh, yeah they, uh, there was an opportunity to uh, work at a fragrance company and now I have this uh, great career so, awesome. so uh, yeah so, so some of the other things that uh, have changed with COVID though uh, have been the uh, customer interface uh, those kind of things have changed uh, we, we uh, with me being on a technical side, I uh, will uh, sometimes be called in to uh, be talk, you know, to talk with uh, our customers and kind of troubleshoot some of the problems they're having, or uh, offer um, solutions to some of their uh, formulation problems. So uh, those customer interfaces have been kind of changed quite a bit, and uh, we, we do the uh, Microsoft Teams and Skyping and all that. So the so technology, uh, do embrace it, uh, don't, don't avoid it. Uh, some of the other things like uh, Bill had mentioned is uh, how you uh, represent data. As we know with uh, COVID, uh, it became political. So science uh, really wasn't uh, seen as, uh, it, it, just the facts uh, just weren't uh, really uh, listened to as well. So your message has to be, uh, Pervade to uh, not only to mainstream because uh, with uh, the flavor world, uh, there are a lot of things that are uh, trending, and uh, so so you get uh, the common things like right now the big trend is sustainability, and a lot of people's uh, mind of sustainability could be different uh, in how they uh, how they interpret it uh, for for us. So. We like to emphasize that yeah we can reduce carbon footprint by having higher yielding varieties uh, with uh, you know like uh, less water use, but then also uh, you know also give a uh, our customer uh, a product that can have uh, less carbon footprint. 
uh, on their products and have a reliable source while uh, maintaining the uh, uh, just the economic uh, stability of the the growers that raise these uh, products because mint is grown in the states and in India so so that they, they have to make a, a sustainable living so sustainable I will never have I will never be able to have another piece of gum or brush my teeth without thinking about you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Perfect, thank you for that. Um, okay, what about Christine? Just as far as like, what does your typical day look like, both before and after COVID? So uh, if you ask my kids, they would say, all you do, mom, is go to meetings. And they only know that because I'm mostly working from home. Today, I'm not. I come into the office periodically, and especially when I have meetings with external folks or folks that just you know are broader than just my team uh, when I can. But primarily, I, I'm working from home. Um, as it relates to a you know, typical day before, so I manage a group of, of folks that um, implement our stormwater program and our underground injection control program. So stormwater is exactly, you all probably know what it is. It's the, um, it is regulating industrial construction and um, municipal stormwater throughout the whole state. And then our underground injection control program is the program that uh, protects groundwater. So discharges of water that uh, people um, put underground to protect groundwater. And so my folks do a ton of different things, um, including you know lots of science because we renew permits and we issue permits and our permits have to be protective of all the uses in the state. And in Oregon, um, the same with the Pacific Northwest is um, we have a lot of endangered species, including salmon. And so the um, protection of salmon and the you know long-term plans associated with that um, require uh, you know really important um, actions from a regulatory standpoint to make sure that all the water that gets discharged into our rivers is um, you know, is safe for salmon. So um, my folks write permits, um, you know, I help them from, uh, you know, policy decisions and conversations with stakeholders. My folks also review a lot of permit applications. So anytime a construction site that's greater than an acre is, um, is happening, they have to get a permit from us. So my folks review those permits. Um, and also they do all the inspections and all the enforcement associated with those inspections. So I'm like I said, I manage the team of people and, and the work is the same for us. It's just how we do our work is is different because we're not all in the office um, and and all the inspections are happening solo as opposed to, you know, talking with people on sites, um, you know, because we're everyone we're working to make sure that everybody is safe uh, everywhere. So. Thank you. Sounds busy. <laughs> OK. Um, all right, Bill, um, if you would share for us, what does a typical day look like for you? Um, in one word, Zoom. Oh. Uh, so I work with people and that's how I. Um, that's how the projects that I work on affect change in the conservation world is because the behaviors of people who I work with farmers have a lot of consequences for uh, the natural resources uh, in our area. It's, it's definitely water quality being um, at the top of, of that list. So for us to move the needle on that, it takes lots and lots and lots and lots of conversations uh, with individual people. So one on one conversations, we're really trying to like understand the story of the person I'm working with, uh, how they got to where they are, um, before COVID, I was doing those on the farm. I was traveling constantly. Uh, I was putting hundreds of miles on my car, an electric car, uh, every day, every week, um, going to farms. Um, I'm not a farmer, so I was always uh, telling the farmers that they, they could educate me. And uh, I was literally like riding around in the combines with them or like walking through the milking stalls with them and uh, hearing about their life and understanding where they come from. So now that it's not safe to meet in person, um, I'm on Zoom all the time. And so uh, not only am I having conversations with individual folks, but I'm also uh, facilitating meetings and trying to find ways where I can help groups of people move forward and make decisions uh, about the project that we're working on and the goals that they've set uh, in their area 
And these are watershed, they call, we call these farmer-led watershed councils. And so these are groups of farmers within a shared watershed uh, who are all um, uh, have that similar geography. And these are conservation farmers. So they're doing things like they're not tilling their soil. They're, they're planting cover crops. Uh, they're feeding the soil biology with that. Um, and they see the benefits of that, but their neighbors do not. Um, so the question is, is how do you get the person next to you who's farming next to you to see a new path uh, and to take that first step towards changing their approach to growing crops? So um, I do a lot of support. I help farmers communicate their message. I help them learn how to have a, a, a difficult conversation with their neighbor um, and help them run good meetings and help them uh, have outreach events. So I'm on Zoom all the time and I just talk and talk and talk and talk and I listen and I listen and I listen uh, and I plan for these uh, conversations to make sure that they can be as effective as possible because every conversation is an opportunity uh, to help move someone uh, one step forward. Okay, of note, communication skills, very important in your position. Yes. Um, okay, Jess, um, what about you? Um, first, I want to preface, there's some little children playing outside in the snow right now. It has not snowed here in a really long time, so I'm sorry if you hear some random screaming. <laughs> Um, so my typical day before COVID, um, like I said, I was working on a contract job at the Zoological Society in Milwaukee, and um, my contract was really inconveniently ended right as COVID began. Um, so I actually spent, you know, a good portion of the summer and, and of COVID, the pandemic, um, looking for a job and kind of navigating looking for a job during this time. Um, I'm sure that kind of will come into play a little bit farther down with some of the other questions I can get in more into what that looked like. Um, so I just recently started my job on November 2nd. Um, as I said, I'm an environmental technician, but that's more that's my formal title. My working title is more of an associate research scientist. Um, so I mainly focus currently on projects related to reptiles and amphibians that are threatened or endangered in the state of Illinois. So I live in the St. Louis area, but my work takes place um, right over the Mississippi River in um, southern Illinois at the research station. And all my field sites are in southern Illinois, though I do also have some related to salamanders in the Smoky Mountain National Park on the border of North Carolina and Tennessee. So you know, I only can speak to what I've been doing thus far and how, you know, it's kind of been interesting starting a job um, in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, so, you know, all my work right now, since my field season begins in mid-March, is all quantitative and writing. So um, I have been writing up um, assessment forms for the Wisconsin, for the Illinois DNR, sorry, I used to live in Wisconsin, <laughs> for the Illinois DNR um, on kind of a uh, conservation guidelines for uh, bird voice tree frogs, which are threatened in Illinois, and how they can use management plans to help um, preserve and conserve bird voice tree frogs. Then I've also been looking at uh, the analysis that I'm going to be doing for my research once I have gathered data on bird voice tree frogs, which is spatial mark recapture. So I do a lot of coding in R um, and a lot of teaching myself statistics, which, you know, if I was to go back and talk to myself in high school or something like that, the girl who really hated math and didn't think she was any good at math. Um, I do math like every day now. <laughs> um, and I took a ton of qualitative uh, courses throughout undergrad and grad school. So if you get a chance to take a statistics class with Dr. Um, Ogle, I guarantee you'll, you'll really appreciate it if you wind up going on to grad school because I definitely had a leg up with learning R in undergrad compared to in grad school. So a lot of my days are just writing and researching and learning about the species that I'm going to be uh, working with in the field and then learning how to do um, and practicing with some of my data analysis that I'm going to be doing. Come mid-March, I'm going to be doing field work. And what that means is uh, every couple of weeks, I'll be going down to Southern Illinois to various field sites and you know collecting data actually on these specimens. So I'm working primarily with bird voice tree frogs, timber rattlesnakes, Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes, Kirtland snakes, um, lots of snakes, <laughs> and then salamanders. And then I do also have work, work uh, working with damselflies and dragonflies will come up in the next few years. 
Um, and then I also will be doing outreach work as well, which is kind of where you help bring the science that you're learning to the general public. So instead of me just publishing this work in science journals where only scientists will see it, I'm going to be working on kind of bringing that uh, information down to the general public. So individuals can also be learning, you know, why do we care about timber rattlesnakes? Why do we care about bird voice tree frogs? Um, because, you know, Bill mentioned something really important before, you know, discussing about how like human interactions come into play. And I always tell people that wildlife management is actually people management because, you know, I can't tell the bird voice tree frogs where they should be going and where they should be living. Um, but I can tell, you know, community members and managers how they should be managing their land for bird voice tree frogs. Um, so really human dimensions does play a really big role in a lot of science careers. So. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a typical day for me right now, still trying to figure out how it all works since I just started a couple months ago, so. Okay, everybody's extremely busy. Um, <laughs> all right, so next um, point that, you know, I love to hear from um, our panelists is like, obviously we know the world has been turned upside down, um, but what do you think are some of the short-term things and what might be some of the long-term things that might stay around in your career field? Um, Christine, maybe we could start with you again. Sure. Uh, so from a short term perspective, the, you know, all work from home all the time for the most part is, you know, I think probably common for lots of folks, but in, I would say in the, the public sector, which I think is a good thing is that I, I expect there's going to just be a lot more flexibility with where people work and how they work. Um, and, and I think that's going to be very important because I, I think that it's very clear that, you know, over the course of the last 11 months, uh, a ton of work has gotten done. And I think some of the preconceived notions about um, having to always be in the office to, you know, get work done is just not real anymore. And so I, I expect that there's just going to be a lot more flexibility on, you know, what people's workday looks like and where they're working from. And I think that's good. Uh, personally, I, I think it's actually really important and really healthy. At least it'll be for for the um, agency that I work for, because um, I think that really will help people with the, you know, constant challenges that um, you know, people have of, you know, having a work life balance that works for them. So thanks. Yeah. Good point. Um, anybody else to to jump in there too? I guess I don't have to call on you all. <laughs> you can add in your points. Um, what do you think will stay and what might go back about your field or position? I, I know in uh, the flavor world, uh, a lot of our uh, customer contact with uh, sales teams have been uh, really uh, hampered. Uh, so we, we had to get creative with that because uh, the travel restrictions and I don't really, I know as a short term, it's been uh, halted completely, but I think in the long term, I think the, the company is really saying that we can uh, innovate and step out of the box and really uh, use technology to our uh, advantage. I know in the um, scientific world, uh, just uh, the research scientists uh, collaborate, I think, a, a lot more because of this. Uh, you might have a little bit extra free time for that, but uh, still projects are getting done. And yeah, we, we, uh, we are uh, still gaining ground in, in the industry. And uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're uh, getting the job done. So yeah, Jess, I know you had some things to um, add to this point as far as like how things are going with like managing field work and what that looks like yeah so um my field work is set to begin in mid-march uh hopefully and i say hopefully because we're still trying to uh figure out exactly how we'll be able to do our field work um you know a lot of people think that field work should be uh, affected because you're outside, except, you know, our field sites are all in southern Illinois, which are about three hours away, 
or in the Smoky Mountains, which are about seven, eight hours away. Um, and there's about three of us who will be working on um, this at a time, uh, in addition to some interns that I'm going to have as well. So right now, the rules for the university and the colleges is that only one person can be in a university vehicle at a time. Um, so us taking a fleet of vehicles uh, really isn't the vi environmental or the economic way um, to try to be traveling, especially when we're doing conservation work. Uh, so we're really trying to figure out right now, like kind of how to get around that stipulation and what we're thinking is going to wind up happening, but you know, still talk with some leaderships is that we're just going to have to get tested uh, constantly. So I'll be going out in the field for about you know, four or five days at a time when I go out. Um, so I'll be with the same group of people. And then we also will either be living in an Airbnb style home. Um, but if they want us to be separated, then we're going to have to be having um, individual hotel rooms, even though like, we're still working together outside anyways. Um, so it's trying to figure that out. It's likely that we're just going to have to have a lot of COVID tests before and after all the time. Um, but I'll let you know <laughs> in, a, in about a month or so how, how that winds up turning out. But, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, field work shouldn't be affected, but you have to think about how you get to the field work, especially if you have like housing or something that you need to, to deal with. Because, you know, I'm, I'm not just going out the, into the middle of nowhere by myself <laughs> um, and doing this because I want to be safe. Uh, and we also don't want to be spending all the money on all the vehicles or all the extra hotel rooms when we could be staying in one location. Um, so that's kind of some of the stuff we're dealing with right now. So many logistics. Um, and then Bill, I'm so curious. I would have to imagine working with farmers that, I mean, you, Zoom is not going to be the rest of your life. <laughs> do you do you think that's fair to say? Bill, are you out there? Yes, hello. I, of course, was muted. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, thanks for asking. The silver lining in this is that the pandemic has forced a lot of people who wouldn't have otherwise uh, gotten themselves acquainted with video conferencing. Uh, they have now become acquainted with video conferencing and they're comfortable with it and it's not awkward. Um, so I actually think that uh, a lot of this type of communication is going to persist post pandemic. And I actually welcome it because. Um, I can actually build a lot more relationships um, without having to put 100 miles on my car just to have one conversation. Um, and nothing replaces face-to-face -face interaction or um, seeing where someone lives or where they work and like walking the field with them and seeing their body language. But, um, and so that's like, a, that's the gold standard of building a relationship. But at the same time, like, uh, I think there's a, a lot of power in uh, virtual communication that I think we're all kind of starting to realize is there. And now people are up to speed on it. And it's not this big, like, exotic thing like, hey, you want to join this Zoom meeting? And uh, a year ago, people would have, most people who I work with would have looked at you like they had no idea what Zoom was. So, yeah, good point. Um, okay. So, what about um, specifically, obviously, I think we have some students here who are probably looking to eventually be paid for work. Um, so what do you um, what what do you think is important to mention as far as like the process for hiring? You know how that's changed as as a result of COVID or, um, you know, any anything like that? Um, Christine, I know that you had something to add on this point specifically. Yeah, well, I, I do. I don't want to say a lot of hiring, but I, I hire regularly just because people move on and um, do other things in my group. And um, and I, I do think that um, just to build on some of the points that have already been made, being comfortable uh, talking to a computer uh, during an interview is something that's really important to do because I, I expect, at least for the foreseeable future, that's that's going to be the way interviews are are done. At least, um, you know, at least for the foreseeable future. And and frankly, I think in some ways it's good because um, you know it can help uh, you know just build comfort in doing things that you're going to have to you know, people are people do and people are, are going to have to do um i think one of the things that i would say that you know is challenging that i 
um, have learned over the last 11 months or so is that um, for folks that have never been in the office with their colleagues, um, figuring out ways to make connections to people in new jobs is super important because you know for folks that have you know moved to Oregon because they got a job here and then the pandemic hit like they don't barely know anybody um and they're working by the you know in their own apartment or in their own space and you know don't have the luxury to you know go for a run with you know whoever sits across the cube wall from them um you know in the, in the lunch hour go grab a cup of coffee with someone else and so you know I think that is just a reality and I think the you know continuing to reach out to people who are are new or you know on the flip side of, of someone being new reaching out to others to feel less isolated um to, to try to have more conversations you know people call them the water co cooler conversations um that is important for everybody to be really intentional about yeah, that's a good point. And students, if you didn't see it yet, I did put a question in the chat. I'm so curious, like, would you consider a fully remote position or job? Um, or would you prefer, you know, a full time in person job or maybe a mix like it's just kind of interesting to me. Um, so I know that we also wanted to touch on, you know, there are some, um, you know, organizations and industries or um, positions that maybe are, you know, putting a hold on hiring, but others are still moving forward. So, um, you know, Tim, I know you had said, unfortunately, your company wouldn't be having internships this year, but Jessica, maybe I'm going to like set this up for you to tell us <laughs> about some opportunities here. Yeah, so um, the National Great Rivers Research and Education Center um, has summer internships every year. Um, I believe, I'm not sure how those worked um, this past summer as I was still not in at that time. Um, I believe that they still occurred. They just had their symposium at the end was a virtual symposium versus an in-person symposium. So we are still hiring for that right now. I believe that Julie has uh, posted out about that already. Um, it is a paid internship uh, and you also can get funding for reimbursement for travel and things like that, housing. Um, not all of the research projects will be occurring um, in the East Alton area where the station takes place. Um, some of them are even just in Wisconsin or things like that. Depends on where um, the per principal investigator for that project, if they have other people that they're working with as well at different institutions. Um, I am hiring for an intern there uh, to work with me with bird voice tree frogs in Southern Illinois. So they would be housed in um, East Alton and travel with us to Southern Illinois. Um, unfortunately, when you do apply for these programs though, you do not apply for specific projects. So you couldn't say that like you want to work specifically with bird voice tree frogs. Um, you are applying to a project subject area. So we work a lot with water quality, watershed work, um, you know, animals that then utilize those watersheds. You kind of pick a topic area that you're interested in. And then from there, if you're accepted into that program, then you're given um, choices of projects that you find interesting. But um, it seems like it's a really great opportunity, um, especially because it is paid and it's paid well. Um, <laughs> so if you have any questions about that, uh, if you'd like to hear more about that internship, you know, please feel free to contact me at the end. My contact information will be there. Um, so that currently is still running as according to plan. Like I said, we might just have a virtual symposium versus uh, a big group gathering. Um, but then I also kind of want to touch on you know, not necessarily hiring for my job, but what I was experiencing when I was looking for a job. Um, you know, I actually was speaking with my now boss about this job in early March, but it took because of hiring freezes and everything um, until September for me to actually be offered this job. And a number of the jobs that I did um, apply for were unfortunately um, either indefinitely postponed, um, completely gotten rid of because they're trying to kind of maximize other uh, areas, other positions so they can what, take in that position, um, or there just wasn't jobs posted. So, uh, you know, it seems like at least for my field, things have been kind of opening up again. 
and things are not being postponed as much, but that might be something that a lot of you run into at this time. Um, however, I would just say like, make sure you just keep in contact with things that you're applying to. I always would just continually, you know, maybe a, a month later, uh, check back in with somebody who I'd applied to and they let me know it was postponed and just see if there was any word on, you know, if they thought the position was gonna be still moving forward at some point, or if it was something that they really feel like it was gonna be canceled at that point. Um, but that's uh, one of the sad realities of looking for a job at this time right now. Um, you know, a lot of places can't necessarily fulfill the hiring aspects that they want to um, just because of, you know, how the job might be as well. Like if it is really something that needs to be face to face and that isn't something that could be done right now safely. Yeah. Okay, actually that leads into the next um, point really well. So, you know, we've got amazing Northland students here who are going to be amazing, um, you know, graduate students or um, employees somewhere. Um, what advice would you give for them? Um, you know, what advice would you give to a student that might be graduating somewhat soon or maybe students that are looking for internships? Like, how can they stand out? What's important, you know, for them to know if they're interested in your, you know, industry? Um, anybody feel free to pop in. Hi everyone. I, I guess I have two two thoughts I would share related to this. The first is that one of the things that I've learned, and I think a lot of folks, this you know, after you're doing whatever you're doing um, and you have different jobs, is you learn what you don't like. You learn what you like, but you also learn what you don't like by taking different jobs that you would you know weren't necessarily thinking were right for you. And I think that is from a career perspective that is so important. And so I always encourage folks that I talk to to apply for any position, you know, if it's at a place that you're interested in working, regardless of what that position is, um, even in some ways, if it's, a, you know, if it's administrative, um, it's, you know, it's a good way to learn an organization and it's a good way to get your foot in the door because at least in the, the public sector, right, wrong or indifferent, um, it's a lot easier to get a job when you have a job. And um, and and so having any job is better than no job um, because that's how you get experience. And it's a you know, it's a it's a vicious cycle, which is so unfortunate, but it is reality. Um, the other to get to your other point, Julie, about sticking out, you know, what I always tell folks, too, because one of the things I do is after I interview people, um, at least the in person or the final interviews and, and for folks I don't offer the position to, I always offer to um, provide people feedback on their interviews. And so and, I, and I'm always happy to um, do that with anybody. And one of the things I, I often have to say to people is that how important it is to really be your authentic self. So, you know, you don't have to know exactly what you want to do and you don't have to have it all figured out. But I will hire someone any day that says I want to work at DEQ because I believe that protecting Oregon's waters is, you know, is that's how I want to spend my days or I um, you know, making sure that we can fish and swim in Oregon um, and, and me being a part of that is important. Like I would hire that person any day over someone who gives me a list of things uh, that they've done in their life, but who does not at all seem interested of um, working for the mission of our agency, um, which is to you know protect and enhance Oregon's land and air and water. So really think about like do a little research. What is the organization's mission and how do you connect to that? And in in think just, you know, a couple sentences to connect yourself to that in interviews or in cover letters. Those are the things that make a difference, not the long list of things that you've done. Not that that's not important, but what makes you stand out? That's what makes you stand out. We hear that over and over and over <laughs> when we do these panel um, events. You know, all of the panelists always say that. You know, it's like uh, that that passion piece is what kind of helps an applicant stick in somebody's mind. Um, so, very good advice. Um, does anybody else want to add something to this? Yeah, I can. I can jump in. I would just. Um... I would echo what Christine just said. I probably interviewed over 100 people when I was at the DNR, and the people who I hired demonstrated in the interview to me that um, they wanted the job and that it connected to some aspect of their purpose, whether it was a passion in their life or their career, but like they, I was clear they wanted it. Um, I did not want to hire someone 
who was just doing a job. Um, the other thing I would add that um, I think is important is while you're uh, on your career path, seek out mentors, people who are who are doing something that you think you want to do or someone who knows something that you want to know and build up the courage just to ask them if they would spend time with you. Um, and I learned that from Jim Meeker, who was an amazing botanist, and I wanted to know all the plants that he knew. And I asked if I could go out to his house and follow him around in the woods. And he allowed me to do that. And he was gracious with his time and it would change my life. And it was something that I learned I could do throughout the rest of my life. Whereas I could ask people, will you take me out with you? And uh, it's one of the most important lessons I've learned in my life and career. Uh, so I'd encourage all of you to just find mentors and you have to, you have to ask them. They're not just gonna, they're not just gonna say, hey, come follow me around. Cause usually people who are knowledgeable are, are also like, um, yeah. So just build up the courage to ask people. Yeah. Um, and what you're doing right now, everybody who is attending this, this is your perfect opportunity you know, to reach out to these um, panelists or somebody else that is attending um, and say, hey, like I was really interested in that you know, topic during the panel event. And that's how you start it. Um, so I know that we're getting a little bit crunched on time, but I want to make sure um, to open up um, for students, alumni, anybody else, you know, do you have other questions? Um, I do have information up on the um, screen too for, for everybody um, to connect with our panelists. So please um, feel free to, you know, take notice of that. But um, does anybody have questions? Students, this would be your time. Uh, the last the last slide still. What was uh, that? Can I just make a note about the last slide still about yes. people who are going to be for jobs and internships? Yes. So um, uh, I wanted to make the note that, I mean, yes, I totally agree with what Christine and Bill said. Like, always make sure that you are researching the organization that you are going to be interviewing for, um, because it definitely comes across that you are passionate about them and it shows how much more interested you are. And mentors also are amazing, especially, um, you know, I, like I mentioned before, I was first generation college student, so I had no idea what I was doing. So my mentors have meant everything to me. Um, I still have mentors that I speak with at Northland, even almost six years later um, after graduating, who still, uh, you know, really positively impact my life. But for as far as networking and the importance of networking, I just wanted to touch on, I know Julie just had a networking workshop that some of you guys may have been a part of, but I wanted to express also, you know, if you guys come across um, an organization that you think is doing really awesome work or even just a specific person who's doing research that you are really interested in, do not be afraid to reach out to them and, and see what opportunities that organization has. I actually got my gap year job at the Field Museum by just reaching out to researchers at the Field Museum um, and stating that I was interested in the research they were doing. I provided them with my CV. I let them know I was planning on taking a gap year. Um, what my interests were research-wise, and then if they had any sort of um, opportunities or knew of any opportunities to let me know. And um, that's how I landed my job as a mammals research assistant. That was not a job that was even planned on being posted. Um, my boss at that time, he just had some extra funding laying around. It was like, you know what, actually, I could use a lot of help. Um, and that's how I got that job. So and I know other people from grad school who reached out to individual um, organizations that they thought were doing great work and happened to catch that organization right before they formally posted something. Or like, you know, we were just gonna post this job, but you seem like a perfect fit. So even if you like don't, you know, you're keeping an eye on the job and you don't see them posting anything at that organization, like do not be afraid to reach out to them. Cause even if they don't have anything at that time, at least they can put your name down for later. And if they do have a position later, they'll remember you and be like, hey, this person was so interested they reached out before we should put them maybe higher up on that list. Um, and uh, also a plug too, I do have a branding yourself workshop that's gonna be tomorrow <laughs> with Northland about creating a professional online presence, um, which is extremely important during this time of COVID. Um, you know, when we're all interacting digitally and this is the first time a lot of people might be doing this and kind of trying to help uh, curate that professional online presence. So um, if that's something any of you guys are interested in, that is gonna be at 5.30 um, tomorrow and you guys can register for that as well. So. 
Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for making sure I didn't for, um, go on without that being plugged. Um, I'm going to put the link into the chat. Um, so, you know, such important points. I, you know, um, we're living in this virtual world. Like, it, this is where we are right now. You've got to figure out how to, you know, make yourself kind of stand out among everybody else that's, you know, online. And those are all amazing ways to do it. Um, so, um, other questions, students, alums, anybody want to give a shout out? Um, you know, anything else that you are curious about and want to ask? Of course, you know, the contact information is up on the screen, so you can certainly um, reach out individually. Um, but if anybody has questions, you know, before we kind of wrap up for today, um, this would be the time to ask them. I guess just one last comment on uh, the last uh, slide. I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but uh, just uh, really uh, tailor your resume uh, as a lot of the uh, panelists uh, had mentioned. Uh, don't just shotgun your resume out there. You know, it's just, uh, yeah, you, you really have to uh, get the get the right, right talking points, uh, emphasize the the points that actually relate to the job to get those uh, right at the top, uh, get get a mentor or uh, someone else to uh, really uh, look over your resume to look for the typos and just uh, make sure you're uh, applying for the right job because you're going to be sending out so many jobs, you're going to, your eyes are going to get crossed. And so yes, uh, do those kinds of things. And then it just really takes uh, two things, uh, just a, uh, a lot of grit. Uh, you're going to get some rejections, uh, lots of rejections, but then uh, you know you, you got to persevere and uh, have a great support network too. You, you sometimes you have to really look in the mirror. Uh, you know, are, are you really, uh, you know, just uh, really trying to make the right uh, impact? Are, are you uh, are you uh, trying to uh, really uh, support the the the, your, the position? Uh, fully uh, as far as like uh, uh, like because uh, you've got to be willing to carry the torch as uh, a lot of uh, the panelists have mentioned uh, to uh, find that passion. Yeah, so important. Thank you. You're you're talking to my career services heart there. Tailor your resume. Yeah, um, yes, yeah. <laughs> I put a link to a resume writing workshop in the um, chat for students too. Um, all right, I thank you so much to our panelists. I, you know, we um, really hope that um, everybody who attended felt like this was just really helpful information and um, maybe also just a little bit of reassurance. <laughs> um, I think we can all use that right now. Um, so, you know, panelists, thank you so much for your um, amazing advice and, you know, words of wisdom and um, students and alums who attended. We really appreciate you attending and engaging. Um, you know, that's what makes this exciting and makes it worth it. So um, thank you, everybody who was involved today. Um, Jackie, am I missing anything you wanted to say? I would just say that these are, you know, just four of many amazing alumni that we have. And, you know, I think you heard over and over again, just reach out. Um, you know, we have a great LinkedIn group going right now and even the Northland Alumni Facebook page. I mean, even LinkedIn's career guy, you know, professional. Um, and honestly, Jess and her Twitter are wizarding. So follow Jess on Twitter and make sure that you tune in tomorrow to learn how to use social media to your benefit because it really is the wave of the future regardless of how old you are. Yeah. FYI, Sarah Johnson, I think I saw you in here. Um, during the grad, the science grad school panel we had in the fall, all of the scientists that were on that panel said, if you are in the sciences, you need to be on Twitter. Um, and Jess was like, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> she'll talk about that tomorrow. Uh, yeah, and it's important to know too. I mean, I guess once again, you know, I mentioned networking and getting my job at the Field Museum before grad school, just through reaching out via email. But you know, a spoiler alert to those who do come to my panel tomorrow, um, I did get my current job from Twitter. Um, so that's how important 
uh, this is. And I had many other people reach out to me about jobs because of posts I made on Twitter. So please, I know a lot of people don't see the value in it necessarily yet. And I think it's silly that I have spent time in trying to develop this, but I have found a lot of success with it. And I know other people have as well. Um, and it's not necessarily just a one career thing. It can benefit all careers um, and it can benefit all ages. So if you're interested, even in the slightest, um, tune in. So. Zero Johnson. <laughs> okay, I'll just add that spend less time on Twitter, more time outside. If you want to work no. outside, go outside. <laughs> you can be on Twitter, but don't be on Twitter. <laughs> All right. Important distinction. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you again, everybody, for attending tonight. We hope you have a wonderful night. Um, and um, students, um, I will be emailing out the contact information that you're seeing here, but you can also just take a screenshot too. Um, we'll see you all later. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.